they roamed the planet for longer than modern man. Neanderthals. They survived in a treacherous world. Fearless hunters who possessed superior strength and surprisingly advanced tools. But then suddenly they vanished and no one knows why. Was it a clash with modern humans? This may be the best case of a Neanderthal murder victim. Around the globe, scientists are searching for answers and they find clues in unlikely places. An ancient volcano site in southern Italy. The ground at the moment is rising. In the Greenland ice sheet, far from the grounds where Neanderthals once settled. Mounting evidence reveals a surprising new theory. It was not war with modern man that killed off the Neanderthals. It was an apocalypse that might have sealed the fate of our closest human relatives. And what happened to them could easily happen to us. Gibraltar, at the tip of the Iberian Peninsula. Here along the Mediterranean coast, a vast complex of caves dot the shoreline. Today, waves encroach upon them. But 24,000 years ago, with the height of the last ice age fast approaching, the sea level was more than 100 feet lower. This was dry land, home to the very last of the Neanderthals. When we look at the number of sites with Neanderthal fossils and or evidence of occupation, I don't think there's any place in the world that has the density of sites per square kilometer that Gibraltar has. Gibraltar was their stronghold. This is where the population was continuous. It was a place that they lived and liked and survived for a long time. The conditions there were good. And because they were so good, they persisted longer than anywhere else. In this enclave, amid forests of pine, hunters search for prey. Along the shore, Neanderthals fish, living as they have for generations before, unaware that they are the last of a dying breed. They probably didn't realize when their neighboring group further north disappeared that they were on the verge of extinction. They had no way of knowing that. Once their species flourished across Europe and Asia, now their population has dwindled to just a few clans here in the south of the Iberian Peninsula. But what ultimately drove the Neanderthal to extinction? The Gibraltar caves may hold some clues. Paleontologists Clive and Geraldine Finlayson have studied this site for many years and are leading a massive excavation effort. Here for generations, Neanderthal families gathered around the fire and prepared meals together. A far cry from the ape men scientists imagined when the species was discovered in Germany in 1856. Other finds reveal details of a rich and multifaceted culture an aspect of the species that is only now being recognized. Here's a very interesting bone. It's um, from a bird, a scavenger that eats almost exclusively bones. It's got cut marks, so it shows that they've been processed by the Neanderthals. But we don't think they're eating them. What we think is happening with these large birds is that they're getting them for their feathers. These birds have colorful feathers, some of them large, dark feathers, and we think that they're using them to wear them. Other artifacts suggest Neanderthals adorned their bodies with body paint and jewelry, creating a vibrant personal display. So this gives us 
a completely new dimension, something we hadn't suspected until we started to discover these things here. What it means, I think, is that they had uh, ways of symbolizing, abstracting the world. They had ways of um, communicating by signaling, ornamenting themselves. A different picture of Neanderthal is now emerging. That of a species more like us than we ever imagined. Then why and how did they vanish from the world? Who were the Neanderthal? Their story begins 600,000 years ago in Africa with another species the evolutionary ancestors of both Neanderthal and modern humans, Homo heidelbergensis. They are the first humans known to harness the power of fire and hunt with wooden spears. They've advanced over more ancient people. They have bigger brains. They, they, they have adapted in a human-like way but it has none of the specializations that are in Neanderthals, and it doesn't have the specializations that are in modern humans. They're not either like us or like Neanderthals. They're ancestors of us both. In pursuit of more abundant game, some head out of Africa, into Asia. Others settle across Europe, including in what is now Heidelberg, Germany, where their bones are first discovered. When they left Africa and entered Central Asia and Europe, they would have been experiencing a harsher climate in many ways. It's a time of great climactic change, brought on by a slight shift of the Earth's axis that tilts the North Pole away from the sun. The polar caps expand moving across North America and Northern Europe. Temperatures drop by as much as 20 degrees in the Northern Hemisphere. 300 to 400,000 years ago in Europe, the Ice Age elements forge a new breed of man. Homo neanderthalensis the Neanderthal. Where they lived, in Europe and Central Asia, these were the coldest places in human existence in those times. So they were adapting to that. Their complexion has become lighter compared to their African ancestors, enhancing absorption of sunlight during the shorter northern days. Their hair is straight and thick, added protection from the cold. They have a muscular build, more fit for the rugged terrain. They were strong and amazingly healthy. They were, in fact, an extraordinary population. Along with their physical adaptations, Neanderthals find strength and safety in numbers. They live in tight-knit clans, dedicated to the care and protection of each other. You're looking at people that have lived in a challenging landscape for hundreds of thousands of years. These lives are short, and they rely on their groups for their children to be able to survive because the parents might not. By banding together, Neanderthals survive the hardships and thrive in this Ice Age environment. Numbering in the tens of thousands, they spread across Europe, the Middle East, Central Asia, and as far north as Siberia. They were mobile. They're able to get what they need from the landscape where they are. So they're collecting raw materials for tools, and they carry them tens of kilometers, maybe hundreds of kilometers with them sometimes. They're moving in pursuit of being able to find food and survive. They were able to master the environment that they lived in. For now, Neanderthals are masters of their world. But one day, their rule will be threatened by another species, our direct ancestors.
modern humans. Forty thousand years ago, Ice Age Europe. Here, Neanderthals have survived and thrived for three hundred thousand years. They alone have been the masters of this land. But now they face their greatest challenge. A new species has entered their territory. Homo sapiens, modern humans. Like Neanderthal, they are the evolutionary descendants of Homo heidelbergensis. They first emerged 200,000 years ago on the savannas of Africa. 80 to 60,000 years ago, groups of modern humans headed north in search of more fertile hunting grounds into the Middle East and Asia. And a few pushed west, entering Neanderthal's European homeland. They carry throwing spears, a weapon built to kill from a distance. And they are different in appearance evolving in Africa, where water bodies were more and more scattered. It promoted natural selection towards ability to move over large distances quickly, becoming an endurance runner. And with that, a technology that is lightweight, portable, that you can carry around. The newcomers are hunters. And they come seeking the land and game Neanderthals claim as their own. Whenever human populations come into contact, historically, there's always cases of warfare. These guys are coming, they're trying to steal our land, we have to fight them. And you always see that. Whenever you see modern humans disperse, I have to believe that Neanderthals and modern humans would have been the same way. For over a century, many scientists have marked this as the beginning of the end for Neanderthal. Within 10,000 years of modern humans' arrival, Neanderthals would disappear across most of Europe. The timing seems more than coincidental for many scientists. In this theory, Neanderthals were extinguished by invading modern humans. And there is tantalizing evidence linked to this theory, a clue from what might be the world's oldest cold case, a 40 to 50,000 year old rib from a Neanderthal skeleton found in an Iraqi cave. It bears the mark of a fatal wound. This may be the best case of a Neanderthal murder victim. But who is the killer? There are only two possibilities another Neanderthal, or an invading Homo sapien. In Metman, Germany, at the Neanderthal Museum, forensic anthropologist John Hawkes examines the ancient evidence, searching for answers. The thing is that this rib has this big gash in it. It was clearly made by some sort of stone point or, or a sharp edge. The next door rib, the eighth rib, has only a very minor reaction on it. So that indicates that the point that made this injury was very small. This suggests a precision cut blade, a weapon unlike the heavy Neanderthal thrusting spear. Some sort of small point made this injury punched into the thoracic column. The blade entered at a 45 degree angle the downward trajectory suggests a weapon thrown overhead. So that indicates that this was a projectile point made by a modern human. This is evidence that there was conflict between the species. And in this encounter, a Neanderthal clearly lost. But survival would also depend on the ability to cope with a bitter Ice Age climate. Who was best physically built to withstand extreme cold? The muscular, stocky Neanderthal or the tall, lean, modern human? 
Yeah, come on over. So we're going to gear you guys up here in a minute. To find out, we're putting two volunteers with two distinct body types to the test in a deep freeze environment. One of the volunteers stands tall for modern man. The other, stocky and muscular, like Neanderthal. They're now in the main chamber of minus 166. This is 30 degrees colder than the lowest temperature ever recorded on Earth. For this test, our subjects will endure a survivable but excruciating three minutes in the cryo chamber. Much longer, and they risk hypothermia, shock, and even death. Two minutes. Lab technicians closely monitored the volunteers. One minute left. One minute. Seconds. Time's up, go and exit the chamber. Okay, so they're going to be exiting the chamber here and we're going to get skin temperatures. Call it out. 56, 51. The volunteer with the more muscular build has retained a higher skin temperature. So you can see here that Jason's internal temperature, muscle temperature, is several degrees higher than Matt's. Under thermal imaging, the advantages of a stocky frame become even more apparent. The warmest areas are shown in red, the coldest in blue. But that's not all. It's interesting, you can see during this you know, minute while they're out, they're starting to rewarm and Jason actually is starting to rewarm pretty rapidly. The more muscular body also recovers faster. But why? Around the skeletal area where the muscle is, there's more vascularity. You're getting circulation in those areas pretty rapidly. Because they evolved in a cold climate, Neanderthals developed a body type tailor-made for the world they lived in they possessed superior physical strength and stamina. So what advantage did modern humans have? It must have been brain power. one area where Neanderthal's brain differs from ours. The back part is a little extended, you know, right inside that occipital bun, and it's possible that that makes a difference to the functions of the back of the brain. The occipital bun contains the occipital lobe, the area involved with processing visual information, like pattern recognition and depth perception. For hunters, these are critical visual clues used to identify prey and hit their target with deadly accuracy. This points to Neanderthals having exceptional vision. So this is a possible functional difference between Neanderthals and us. But the true measure of Neanderthals' brain power lies in how they applied it to survive challenges in their environment and how they kept pace with the inventions of their modern human rivals. The best examples are the tools they built. To the untrained eye, Neanderthal knives appear crude, even primitive, especially when compared to the precision chiseled blades and spearheads crafted by modern humans. Neanderthals would make knives um, that basically would get done in a couple minutes at most. Um, so rather than trying to impress with how fancy their technology looks, they're interested in getting the job done. Modern Homo sapien technology seems to be a lot more elegant. You know, a piece like this would take several hours to make, sometimes a day. But a quickly made knife is not necessarily an inferior one. For a Neanderthal to make a spearhead, uh, it's just not a lucky blow. 
Neanderthals were able to create their stone flakes that not only had incredibly sharp edges, but the edges were incredibly strong. Archaeologist Metin Aaron is uncovering Neanderthal tool-making techniques by replicating their methods. While it looks easy to make these stone flakes, um, it actually took me about a year and a half to learn how to make and replicate the same exact technology um, that Neanderthals did. One reason why the Neanderthal technology is so hard is that it's necessary to get a precise geometry in the rock that you're, you're making. Neanderthal stone cutters targeted small fissures and cracks. In a sense, they saw the blade within each rock and struck accordingly a visionary technique. A Neanderthal could easily make 50 to 60 to 70 stone flakes uh, from a single nodule of flint. So I think in, in a very real sense, you could say it was almost assembly line stone flake production. This seemingly unremarkable object, uncovered in a German mine in 1963, is a piece of technological history. This 50,000-year-old artifact bears the stamp of its original Neanderthal owner. It's a very small, black, unremarkable thing, but it's a sensation. What you can see here is an imprint from wood. And when you turn it around, there is another imprint of a stone point. And below that, a Neanderthal fingerprint. What's so remarkable for chemist Christian Wunderlich isn't just the maker's mark, it's the substance itself. Chemical analysis reveals that it does not occur in nature, making it the world's oldest synthetic material. It's an adhesive distilled from birch bark called pitch a kind of Stone Age superglue. Neanderthals used pitch to form a rock-hard bond between stone blades and wooden shafts, making their thrusting spears more durable and deadly. But the most impressive part of the landmark adhesive is the process involved with its production, a process that scientists could only figure out in the controlled environment of a lab. You have to invent this and tinker with the recipe in order to do it properly. And it's hard for us to learn how to do. Birch pitch only emerges when the bark is heated to around 750 degrees Fahrenheit. The problem is, in open air, the bark ignites at much lower temperatures. So how did the Neanderthals do it? Christian Wunderlich and a colleague are attempting to make pitch using only materials available to Neanderthals. First, they place the birch bark in a container, like the goose egg seen here. Next, an empty container with a wider opening is buried in the ground. It will later collect the pitch. Then Wunderlich places the container with the birch bark on top of it. Mud is then applied to seal the two containers, preventing oxygen from rushing in and sparking the ignition process. The birch pitch that they're creating in order to use as a glue to adhere things together, it's so complicated, the steps that you have to carry out to create this accurately. And they're doing it, and they're doing it apparently for long periods of time. Hot coals are used to heat the birch bark inside the goose egg container. As temperatures rise to 750 degrees Fahrenheit, the oily pitch will begin to ooze out. Normally, 30% of the birch bark becomes pitch. The entire procedure takes 20 to 30 minutes but the process itself is over 200,000 years in the making. 